I'm going to share some of our updated results about the changing face of the reefs in Little Cayman in response to the 2023 heat wave. So you all probably know some of this information about how coral reefs across the Caribbean and across the globe have been declining for the last 30, 40 years. Um, and a lot of this is due to major storm events such as hurricanes or outbreaks of disease such as white band disease that affected the Acroporas, our branching corals here. And that led to this trajectory of decline where in the Caribbean, for example, we had roughly 75% coral cover in the early 1970s. And at present time, it's roughly around 5% region wide. So that's a huge drop in coral cover. You know, these huge expanses that are now covered by algae used to be big thickets of corals. And scientists have been talking about this for years, decades, and screaming from their, <laughs> their offices and wherever they can to try and get people to pay attention to the impacts uh, of of our ocean use of climate change on coral reefs. And so, you know, we're not the first to be looking at this, but we are definitely among those trying to monitor and project what's going to happen. And I think the biggest impact that has happened thus far is the fourth global bleaching event, which was just announced in April by uh, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Association, NOAA. Um, and this bleaching event actually started in um, the Northern Hemisphere in the summer of 2023 and then progressed into the Southern Hemisphere in the spring, winter of uh, 2024. And so when we're talking about like how coral reefs have changed on a global basis, you can see that this isn't just a Caribbean phenomena. So these areas on the map that are colored in warm colors, like these oranges, are all locations where we've seen a loss of coral cover over time. Now there are places on this map that you'll see that are highlighted in purple, which means that they have maintained a positive percent coral cover. And if you look right here, this is Cuba, we are right in that spot. So over the long term, uh, this region has actually been somewhat buffered from these impacts such as climate change, disease outbreaks, etc. However, on a global scale, the trajectory is for wide scale loss. And this not only affects the corals, but also the fish, right? The fish have to use the reef as a place to live. They need places to hide. They need places to lay their eggs. They need things to eat. A lot of them eat either things growing on the reef or some actually eat the coral themselves. Um, and so over time, not just climate change, but the impacts of our, our fishing have led to a decline in our fishery stocks as well. So this isn't just a decline in coral we're talking about. It's whole ecosystem uh, effects that we're looking at at the, at the moment. So you can tell this is um, catch per unit effort, so or this is catch, so how many fish they're catching, and this is catch per unit effort. And so, you know, they're putting in as much time, and for a while they were catching more fish. And, you know, they're putting in the same amount of time and getting more and more fish. This technology is evolving, and so they're able to catch more fish. But over time, they are starting to have to put more effort into every single fish that they catch. And so it's, they're catching less fish for the same amount of effort. So in Little Cayman, we're in one of those unique spots that was highlighted in purple. And that is because we are highly protected, extremely isolated. It's only 10 miles long, one mile wide. The population doesn't ever really exceed 160 people. And there is very little development. And all of this impacts the surrounding reef, right? Um, everything that we do on the land eventually affects the ocean. If we're building a condo on the beachfront that's going to create erosion, that has to go somewhere and it often lands on top of the corals. That has an impact, right? So everything that we're doing has an effect. And one thing that's really important in Little Cayman to remember is that 57% of the nearshore marine environment is actually under full no-take prote marine protection. This is huge. I mean, from a global perspective, the goal that countries are setting by the IUCN is now 30. 30% 30 of your, your nearshore region should be protected. So Little Cayman has far exceeded that and should be a major uh, spotlight for conservation. And we've been monitoring how this is affecting the reef over time for the last 26 years at CCMI. 
Um, so every summer we do a standard set of surveys and we follow a protocol called AGRA, the Atlantic and Gulf Rapid Reef Assessment. And because we're using a standard protocol, we're then able to compare year after year after year what's happening on our reef. We've been doing this since 1999 with our team of scientists, interns, volunteers, whoever we can get to help us at this time of year when we're doing it, it's fairly intensive. Um, and we survey all around Little Cayman. So, uh, so what we're doing with these surveys is that we are counting the fish. So the first thing we do is we lay down a transect onto the reef. We swim along with this transect and our slate. We identify every single fish that we see within a meter of either side of that tape, and we estimate how long it is. So every fish gets counted in this 60 meter squared area. We then lay down a 10 meter tape, and along that 10 meter tape, we use this uh, measured bar, and every coral that we encounter along that 10 meter tape, we identify it, we measure it, the height, width, and um, length so that we can estimate its size and we assign it a health status. Is it healthy? Is it bleached? Is it diseased? Etc. cetera. Uh, and then also along this 10 meter long transect, we set down a small little square every two meters. And inside that square, we visually estimate the percent cover of all the different things. So how much sponge is there? How much crustose coralline algae? How much coral? How much, um, how, how much macro algae, et cetera. And by doing that, we get a good um, holistic picture of what the reef is looking like over time. And this, this is the coral data up until last summer. So the last point here is 2023. Um, you can see that there's been gradual fluctuations. I feel like my animation, oh, it did work, okay. There, you know, it's going dipping and then coming up and going back down and then going back up. For, but for the last 10 years, more or less, we've had this very positive consistent upward trajectory in coral cover in Little Cayman. And this is probably related to that extreme marine protection, as well as you know, the lack of anthropogenic or human impacts on the reef because of our isolation. However, we have seen some signs of change. So again, here we're still, this is ending in 2022, um, because I'm gonna talk about 2024 in a minute. Um, but you can see that even though our reef was considered quite healthy, if you're talking about coral cover, we are still seeing changes. So previously in 1999, the most dominant coral was the, the great star coral, the, the orbicellas, the ones that make up the majority of like, if you're diving at Eden Rock, you'd see these huge orbicellas, right? And they're big, giant boulder corals. Those used to be the predominant coral. Um, and over time, their frequency or contribution to the reef has declined and these weedy species that are quite small have taken over. And those are the agariceids, uh, sometimes called like leaf corals, um, and the parietes, which um, locally known are the mustard hill coral. The difference is that these aren't really major reef building species. They don't really get much bigger than about this big. Their skeletons are relatively fragile. Um, so they're not having the same function as what used to be the dominant species. And this is um, not unique to Little Cayman. This has actually been happening uh, across the Caribbean since even before humans were having an impact. So even um, in the Pleistocene, we started, you can start to see some of these changes begin where you're seeing a loss of these extremely competitive species, the branching acroporids and an increase in stress tolerant species and a dramatic increase in these weedy species. Um, and so this is a region wide uh, phenomena that's happening with changes in species composition, which means that basically the functionality of this reef is changing over time. So that gets us to 2024. Um, so as you recall, it was very hot in 2020, 2023, it was very hot in 2023. Um, so <clears throat> this is the degree heating weeks for every year from 2000, 1999 to 2023. Um, degree heating weeks is the number of weeks at which the temperature exceeds the, se the seasonal maximum. So if a one degree heating week could be, it's one degree above, one week at one degree above that maximum. A two degree heating week would be two degree, two weeks above at one degree above or one week at two degrees above. So it's somewhat complicated. But what's important to note is that in 2023, that degree heating week metric was extreme. I mean, 18 
degree heating weeks. It's never seen anything like it on the reefs here before. Um, and this is just looking off of the edge of the wall and you can see all the white corals, you know, all the way down uh, the edge of the wall. So what we did um, during this bleaching event was we initiated a series of short surveys at three different sites and we went every two weeks uh, and did uh, a similar protocol where we were swimming along a transect, identifying every coral and assigning it um, a bleaching status. So it's, it's healthy, it's pale, it's fully bleached, it's dead. Um, and these are the data from that. So starting in July through to January, the green line is healthy. So you can see we started with almost every coral on our transect being completely healthy. Um, to mid of the bleaching event, we had 75% of the corals were fully bleached. And by the end of the survey, we only had about 40% of the corals were healthy at the end. And this is interesting because it didn't affect all the different species equally. It wasn't like every single species suffered the same fate. And we could track that through our, our surveys and look at which corals were bleaching, which were dying from the bleaching, and then which ones recovered. And I think that's one of the... Um, one of the things we can get out of this is that there are some species that actually bleached just as much as everything else, but then were able to rebound and come back. Um, however, some in particular, the agaricias, they were making up the majority of the reef, um, but almost 100% of them bleached and died. Uh, so when we did our subsequent surveys this summer, we found very, very few live agaricias. And the same with the parietes parietes. Um, they also bleached very heavily and also suffered high mortality. You guys can come in. <laughs> However, some other species did not suffer that same fate. And what's really curious about this is um, those two species that showed the least bleaching impact were um, Dicosinia stochasi and Meandrina meandrinis. Now, you guys probably don't know anything about who those two species are, and it doesn't really matter, except that they are the two most vulnerable species, species to the stony coral tissue loss disease. So they survived stony coral tissue loss disease, these guys out in Little Cayman, and then they, they turned out to be the ones that are resistant to bleaching. So, you know, it's, it, it is indicative that there's some sort of trade-off, evolutionary trade-off between these species, whether they're selecting to have disease resistance or heat tolerance. Um, so it's quite interesting how that panned out. However, I also wanna point out Orbicella annularis um, and Faviolata. So these two had very high bleaching percentages, but they had very low mortality. So those are those big giant boulder corals, the big ones that used to make up the majority of our reef, and they turned out to be even though they bleached, they recovered from that bleaching and survived. So that's a very positive uh, note to take away from that. Uh, and then after we had finished our bleaching surveys, we went back out in the summer of this year to do our, our annual agri surveys to look at um, the general cover. So this again is the same data I showed before, just in a different format. And so box plots instead of bar graphs. Um, so you've got the year here and the percent coral cover increasing over time to 2023. But when we got to 2024, that coral cover was 9.8%. So we dropped from 26% in 2023 to 98 in 2024. Um, so this obviously is unlike any sort of um, experience we have seen in Little Cayman. And it was very devastating for us to watch it happen in front of our eyes. Um, it's almost like, you know, watching the pandemic, I guess, take, go through the population. We were watching it happen um, to the corals on our reef. And I don't want you to leave here feeling totally devastated because I feel like if we look at this graphic, we can see that there have been fluctuations in that coral cover. Now, granted, this is much lower than it's ever been before. But in the past, Little Cayman has recovered from stress events. Uh, and it took 10 years to get to where it was from this previous low at about 15%. So, you know, if we can give it time, then perhaps it has the opportunity to recover from that. Um, sorry, more bad news. 
So <laughs> this is, this is a, these are donut graphs of the percentage of the reefs that we survey that fall into a various category based on the percent coral cover at that particular reef. So for example, in 1999, 16% of the reefs that we surveyed had um, over 25% coral cover. In 2023, 40% of those reefs had over 25%. In 2024, no reefs had anything over, um, over the 20%. So only 18% had 20% coral cover, but now you see we've got a large majority in this poor category. So it's, um, this is just showing that you know, it didn't just affect one site, it affected everywhere on the island. Um, and there's not much that we could have really done to have buffered this. It was just so hot. Um, what's interesting is how this affected the overall community. So when I say the changing face of coral reefs in Little Cayman, this is what we're talking about now. So if you had been diving there before, you probably would have seen a lot of Agaricea and a lot of Parides Parides. If you go diving there now, you will not see those agariciids. They are no longer there. So you can see that the majority of the reef was taken up by this light blue, which was agaricia, which is nearly completely gone at this point. Um, and the other one was um, parides parides in red is now a very small component of the reef. But again, some positives to take away from this. If you look at the size of the green, bars in these in this graph you can see that that relative frequency of those orbicellids is roughly the same so again they just we were able to maintain these large boulder corals which is really important for the reef uh, but all of this can have major implications for how this reef is going to function going forward right so We've already previously lost the acroporids, the, our big branching corals that we're all trying to grow in our nurseries now. Those are gone. Those create a lot of complexity on the reef and a lot of habitat for juvenile fishes and invertebrates. Now we've also lost some of these other weedy corals like the agariceids and the parietes. Um, and this, so again, is reducing that complexity even more. Um, so the, the concern is that the reef is becoming flatter and flatter over time. Um, and this could eventually affect uh, our fishery stocks um, and, and the overall population of everything else on the reef. So um, I can't come and just talk about the reef in general without actually sharing what happened in our coral nursery in this event. Um, so this is a video of us during of the, the nursery during peak bleaching. Um, you can see that the nearly every single coral was stark white. Um, so if we look at the graph here, we start with um, orange is healthy and the light orange is partially bleached, white is fully bleached and black is dead. And that red line is that temperature. Um, so you can see that we went from roughly 400, 440 corals in our nursery um, to 22 corals remaining alive. And similar to what happened on the reef, there were differences in our nursery with who survived and who didn't. So we started out with 12 different genotypes. So in the past, we have taken samples of all of our corals and sent them off to labs uh, in the States that come back and send us the DNA sequence of each individual. And we can then identify them. We track them over time. We know who is who and who they belong to. So they all have um, you know, letter identifications and each color here is a different genotype. And what's really interesting is that you can see that the, most of them crashed at the exact same time, but a couple of them just didn't care. They got pale, but they never bleached and they were fine. So we have three surviving genotypes of those initial 12 uh, remaining that were showing some sort of genetic basis for resistance or tolerance to heat. And that's really important moving forward as we try to continue to expand our nursery and persist with restoration is trying to identify these individuals that can tolerate disease, that can tolerate temperature, how we can you know, per, uh, assist them in increasing diversity based on those genotypes. So where do we go from here um, in terms of the coral nursery? So our plan going forward, 
um, is we're going to use what we've got left in the nursery, which is we've got those 22 corals. They're still alive. They made it through this summer. So we're going to use those corals, allow them to grow a little bit more. And um, in the winter time, we'll frag them out and increase the number of individuals again in our nursery. We are then hoping to expand our nursery to include some of the species that were hit hardest in the bleaching event. For example, the Parides parides, which is one of the only other branching corals on the reef right now. Um, so we feel that we could apply the same techniques that we use for raising the acropora in the nursery to this other coral species. We also want to do some trials without planting corals deeper and deeper to see if uh, we can buffer them from the impacts of temperature. Um, and then we would like to do some spawning. So if we collect the gametes of the three genotypes we have and we cross fertilize them in the lab to create new genotypes and sort of assist them along this evolutionary track. Um, and finally, um, our ultimate goal long term is to establish a land based nursery where we can be doing some of these uh, this work with increasing genetic diversity, growing corals in the lab and also use that as an area of refuge in future events like this, either disease outbreaks or um, temperature heat waves. But I'm not gonna leave you with that because I wanna leave you on a high point. And so I'm gonna talk about the fish because we're always, you know, we do the coral transects, but we do the fish transects alongside. And I, you know, we got out of the water from these surveys in, in July and the fish team was saying, oh, there were a lot of fish. I was like, yeah, this probably is probably not that much more, but there were a lot more fish. Like I was shocked. I thought maybe I did something wrong with the data. So I, I went back and tried to do it all, like look at all again. I was like, no, it's, it all makes sense. There's like nearly double the number of fish. And it was almost all parrotfish. So there were a lot of herbivores on the reef. Um, and this is intuitive, right? I mean, so we've lost a lot of coral. They're covered in algae and parrotfish eat algae. So they've got a lot of food available. They're probably reproducing. Um, they probably had a great spawning event. And so now we've got a lot of parrotfish on the reef. This is really important because parrotfish are known to be sort of keystone species on coral reefs for mowing down algae. They make available space for baby corals to settle and grow into brand new corals. So it's really important that we've got a lot of parrotfish. This could be the key to making it so that the reef in Little Cayman can recover from this devastating event. Um, and this wouldn't have been possible without the fisheries protection, right? I mean, if we were going out there and removing all these fish with fish pots, this wouldn't, we wouldn't have seen this result. Um, so this is really important um, for maintaining our reefs and keeping this sort of long-term vision of, okay, yes, this happened, but hopefully, you know, the reef has enough innate resilience because we've taken all these other steps that it will come back. Um, so this is the parrotfish, just parrotfish, just this huge exponential increase in parrotfish, which is so cool. Um, this, this little guy is actually from Makabuka. If you, if you go diving up there, you see these huge schools of those parrot, parrotfish. They're awesome. Um, and the grouper, we also saw the same thing. So even though overall carnivore density did not increase when I just looked at specifically at the Nassau grouper, there was this um, extreme increase in the Nassau grouper. And we've been seeing it over time. So I've talked about this in the past that, oh, we're seeing this increase in Nassau grouper, but this year was way high. Um, and I think it will be really cool to see what the Grouper Moon Project finds in in January, February, um, to see if they see the similar thing with so many grouper, um, because that protection is really working. You know, the, the grouper were almost completely extirpated regionally across the Caribbean, and the only remaining spawning site was in Little Cayman. And um, the DOE made this their baby and took to protecting it, and it has done wonders. It took a long time, and it took even enacting stronger initiatives in 2016 and it's post 2016 that we really saw that increase that rebound um, and so this is just evidence of how management does work to protect our fisheries you know the less we take the more buffer we give them to survive and grow and ultimately that will enable this reef to have some some resiliency to impacts of climate change and anthropogenic um, take 
Um, so again, here's the grouper. So you, the recovery began in 2009 and uh, six years after the initial ban. Um, and then they enacted this more extreme regulation in 2016, extending across all of Little Cayman. And that's really what made the difference. Um, so in conclusion, um, the corals were obviously hit extremely hard in 2023 by this heat wave event. <clears throat> and our previously dominant species, which were the agariceids and the parietes, were the ones that were hit the hardest with um, almost completely lost from our reef. However, our long-lived species, such as the star corals, the orbicellids, and the montasserias, even though they bleached, they were able to recover, which highlights potential resiliency to um, heat wave events. Unfortunately, the coral nursery was not immune to the heat wave. Um, however, we learned a lot from this event and we're going to use that to build on how we continue to grow the nursery and how we continue with our restoration practices to um, be more e efficient and have a resilient nursery. Uh, and importantly, fish populations have thrived in many years, particularly since 2016, following the enactment of those regulations. And uh, we've seen this dramatic increase in 2024, which is a great sign for potential resiliency of the reef because the largest increase were these herbivorous fishes, which can eventually and hopefully keep that algae at bay, enabling corals to recruit and reestablish their populations. Um, and again, grouper is such a star here. And I think it's so important that we as a community highlight that as a conservation success story. Um, it's so rare that we have success stories. So this is such a beautiful thing that we can talk about and share um, how we have done a great job protecting this, uh, this species. And finally, uh, future restoration will need to aim to increase genetic diversity to ensure that we have persistence over time, because just like those corals that we saw the individual species, some were disease resistant and some are bleaching resistant, we find the same with, within the genus Acropora. Um, and so it's important to maintain that high genetic diversity so that they can, you know, have individuals that survive whatever comes their way. And with that, I would just like to thank all our sponsors and everybody who has helped with the agri surveys and the bleaching surveys over time, which is an extensive list and this does not cover everybody. So thank you guys. <laughs> <laughs>